Chapter Six of Pathfinders of the Great Plains. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Barrett. Pathfinders of the Great Plains by Lawrence J. Burpey. Chapter Six, La Verandrie's Latter Days. During all this time, the elder La Verandrie had been working at other plans for discovery and for trade in the far west in the year seventeen thirty nine on his return from the first visit to the mandans he had sent his son francois to build a fort on the lake of the prairies now known as lake manitoba when young la verandrie had built this fort he went farther north to cedar lake near the mouth of the saskatchewan river and there built another fort the purpose was to intercept the trade of the indians with the english on hudson bay for over half a century the indians of this region had taken their furs down the rivers leading from lake winnipeg to the trading posts of the hudson's bay company on the shores of the bay but now the french intended to offer them a market nearer home and divert to themselves this profitable trade the first of their new forts was named fort dauphin and the one on cedar lake was called fort bourbon having built fort bourbon francois la verandrie had ascended the saskatchewan river as far as the forks where the north and south branches of that great river join here he met a number of crees whom he questioned as to the source of the saskatchewan they told him that it came from a great distance rising among lofty mountains far to the west and that beyond those mountains they knew of a great lake as they called it the water of which was not good to drink the mountains were of course the rocky mountains and the waters of the great lake which the crees spoke of were the salt waters of the pacific ocean francois la verandrie had continued his work of building forts shortly after building fort bourbon he built Fort Pascoyac on the Saskatchewan, at a place now known as the Paw, between Cedar Lake and the Forks. It is interesting to know that a railway has just been completed to this place, and that it is to be continued from there to the shores of Hudson Bay. How this modern change would have startled the old fur traders! Even if they could have dreamed of anything so wonderful as a railway, we can imagine their ridicule of the idea that some day men should travel from the east to the far-off shores of the Saskatchewan in two or three days a trip which cost them months of wearisome paddling. In carrying on his work in the West, La Verandrie had to face difficulties even greater than those caused by the hard life in the wilderness. His base of supplies was in danger. He had many enemies in Canada who took advantage of his absence in the West to prejudice the governor against him. They even sent false reports to the King of France, saying that he was spending his time not in searching for a way to the Western Sea, but in making money out of the fur trade. This was not true. Not only was he making no money out of the fur trade, but as we have seen, he was heavily in debt because of the enormous cost of carrying on his explorations. For a time, however, the truth did not help him. The tales told by his enemies were believed, and he was ordered to return to Montreal with his sons. He and they withdrew from their work in the West, left behind their promising beginnings, and returned to the East. Never again, as it happened, was the father to resume his work. Another officer, M. de Noyel, was sent to the West to continue the work of exploration. Noyel spent two years in the West without adding anything to the information La Verandrie had gained. By that time a natural reaction had come in favour of La Verandrie, and the acting governor of Canada, the Marquis de la Galissonnière, decided to put the work of exploration again in charge of La Verandrie and his sons. In recognition of his services, he was given the rank of captain and was decorated with the Cross of St. Louis. While these events were ripening, the years passed, and not until 1749 was La Verandrie restored to his leadership in the West. Though now sixty-four years old, he was overjoyed at the prospect. Not only was he permitted to continue his search for the Western Sea, the quality of his work was recognized, for the governor and the king had at last understood that, instead of seeking his own profit in his explorations, as his enemies had said, he had the one object of adding to the honor and glory of his country. He made preparations to start from Montreal in the spring of 1750, and intended to push forward as rapidly as possible to Fort Bourbon, or Fort Pascoyac, where he would spend the winter. In the spring of the following year, he would ascend the Saskatchewan River and make his way over the mountains to the shores of the Western Sea, the Pacific Ocean as we know it today. But the greatest of all enemies now blocked his way. La Verandrie was taken ill while making his preparations for the expedition, and before the close of the year 1749, he had set out on the journey from which no man returns. After the death of La Verandrie, his sons made preparations to carry out his plan for reaching the Western Sea by way of the Saskatchewan River. They had the same unselfish desire to bring honour to their king and to add new territories to their native land. 
moreover this project which their father had had so much at heart had become now for them a sacred duty to their dismay however they soon found that the promise made to their father did not extend to themselves another officer le gardeur de saint pierre was appointed by the governor of canada to carry on the search for the western sea they had spent years of toil and discomfort in the wilderness and endured countless hardships and dangers they had carefully studied the languages manners and customs of the indian tribes and they had found out by hard experience what would be the best means of completing their discovery yet now they were thrown aside in favour of an officer who had never been in the far west and who knew nothing of the conditions he would there be compelled to meet they could at least appeal for justice in a last attempt to obtain this for himself and his brothers francois de la Varendrie wrote this letter to the king's minister quote, the only resource left to me is to throw myself at the feet of your lordship and to trouble you with the story of my misfortunes my name is la Varendrie. my late father is known here in canada and in france by the exploration for the discovery of the western sea to which he devoted the last fifteen years of his life he travelled and made myself and my brothers travel with such vigour that we should have reached our goal if he had had only a little more help and if he had not been so much thwarted especially by envy envy is still here more than elsewhere a prevailing passion against which one has no protection while my father my brothers and myself were exhausting ourselves with toil and while we were incurring a crushing burden of expense his steps and ours were represented as directed only towards our own gain by the finding of beaver the outlay he was forced to incur was described as dissipation and his narratives were spoken of as a pack of lies envy as it exists in this country is no half envy its principle is to calumniate furiously in the hope that if even half of what is said finds favour it will be enough to injure in point of fact my father thus opposed had to his sorrow been obliged more than once to return and to make us return because of the lack of help and protection he has even been reproached by the court for not giving adequate reports upon his work he was indeed more intent on making progress than on telling what he was doing until he could give definite statements he was running into debt he failed to receive promotions yet his zeal for his project never slackened persuaded as he was that sooner or later his labours would be crowned with success and recompense at the time when he was most eager in the good work envy won the day and he saw the posts he had established and his own work pass into other hands while he was thus checked in his operations the reward of a plentiful harvest of beaver skins which he had made possible went to another rather than himself yet in spite of this profitable trade the good work slackened the posts instead of multiplying fell into decay and no progress was made in exploration it was this indeed which grieved him the most meanwhile the marquis de la galissonniere arrived in the country to act as governor in the hubbub of contradictory opinions that prevailed he came to the conclusion that the man who had pursued such discoveries at his own charge and expense without any cost to the king and who had gone into debt to establish useful posts merited better fortune apart from advancing the project of discovery practical services had been rendered there was the marquis reported a large increase of beaver in the colony and four or five posts had been well established and defended by forts as good as could be made in countries so distant a multitude of savages had been turned into subjects of the king some of them in a party which i commanded showed an example to our own domiciled savages by striking at the Anyers indians who are devoted to england progress the marquis concluded could be hastened and rendered more efficacious only by allowing the work to remain in the same hands thus it was that the marquis de la galissonniere was good enough to explain his position no doubt he expressed himself to the court to a similar effect for in the following year that is to say last year my father was honoured with the cross of st louis and was invited to continue with his sons the work which he had begun he made arrangements with great earnestness for starting on his expedition he spared nothing that might make for success he had already bought and prepared all the goods to be used in trade he inspired me and my brothers with his own ardour then in the month of december last death carried him off great as was my grief at the time i could never have imagined or foreseen all that i lost in losing him when i succeeded to his engagements and his responsibilities i ventured to hope that i should succeed to the same advantages i had the honour to write on the subject to the marquis de la jonquiere then governor informing him that i had recovered from an indisposition from which i had been suffering and which might serve as a pretext to some one seeking to supplant me his reply was that he had chosen m de st pierre to go to the western sea i started at once for quebec from montreal where i then was i represented the situation in which i was left by my father 
i declared that there was more than one post in the direction of the western sea and that i and my brothers would be delighted to be under the orders of m de st pierre and that we would content ourselves if necessary with a single post and that the most distant one i stated that we even asked no more than leave to go on in advance of the new leader so that while we were pushing the work of exploration we might be able to help ourselves by disposing of my father's latest purchases and of what remained to us in the posts we should in this have the consolation of making our utmost efforts to meet the wishes of the court the marquis de la jonquiere though he felt the force of my representations and as it seemed to me was touched by them told me at last that m de st pierre did not wish for either me or my brothers i asked what would become of the debts we had incurred m de st pierre however had spoken and i could not obtain anything i returned to montreal with this not too consoling information there i offered for sale a small piece of property all that i had inherited from my father the proceeds of this sale served to satisfy my most urgent creditors meanwhile the season was advancing there was now the question of my going as usual to the rendezvous arranged with my hired men so as to save their lives by bringing provisions and to secure the stores which without this precaution would probably be pillaged and abandoned in spite of m de st pierre i obtained permission to make this trip and i was subject to conditions and restrictions such as might be imposed on the commonest voyageur nevertheless scarcely had i left when m de st pierre complained of my action and alleged that this start of mine before him injured him to the amount of more than ten thousand francs he also accused me without the slightest reserve of having loaded my canoe beyond the permission accorded me the accusation was considered and my canoe was pursued had i been overtaken at once m de st pierre would have been promptly reassured he overtook me at Michilimackinac, and if I can believe what he said, he now saw that he had been in the wrong in acting as he did, and was vexed with himself for not having taken me and my brothers with him. He expressed much regret to me, and paid me many compliments. It may be that this is his usual mode of acting, but it is difficult for me to recognize it in either good faith or humanity. M. de Saint-Pierre might have obtained all that he has obtained. He might have made sure of his interests and have gained surprising advantages and have taken as he desired some relative with him while not shutting us out entirely m de st pierre is an officer of merit and i am only the more to be pitied to find him thus turned against me yet in spite of the favourable impressions he has created on different occasions he will find it difficult to show that in this matter he kept the main interest that of discovery in view and that he conformed to the intentions of the court and respected the kindly disposition with which the marquis de la galissonniere honours us before such a wrong could be done to us he must have injured us seriously in the opinion of m de la jonquiere who himself is always disposed to be kind none the less am i ruined my returns for this year were only half collected and a thousand subsequent difficulties make the disaster complete with credit gone in relation both to my father and to myself i am in debt for over twenty thousand francs i remain without funds and without patrimony moreover i am a simple ensign of the second grade my elder brother has only the same rank as myself while my younger brother is only a junior cadet such is the net result of all that my father my brothers and i have done the one who was murdered some years ago was not the most unfortunate of us his blood does not count in our behalf unless m de st pierre becomes imbued with better sentiments and communicates them to the marquis de la jonquiere all my father's toils and ours fail to serve us and we must abandon what has cost us so much we certainly should not have been and should not be useless to m de st pierre i explained to him fully how i believed i could serve him clever as he may be and inspired with the best intentions i venture to say that by keeping us away he is in danger of making many mistakes and of getting often on the wrong track it is something gained to have gone astray but to have found out your error we think that now we should be sure of the right road to reach the goal whatever it may be it is our greatest cause of distress to find ourselves thus snatched away from a sphere of action in which we were proposing to use every effort to reach a definite result deign therefore monseigneur to judge the cause of three orphans our misfortune is great but is it without remedy there are in the hands of your lordship resources of compensation and of consolation and i venture to hope for some benefit from them to find ourselves thus excluded from the west would be to find ourselves robbed in the most cruel manner of our heritage we should have had all that was bitter and others all that was sweet End quote this eloquent appeal of francois fell upon unheeding ears the appointment of his rival was confirmed the only grace he could obtain was leave to take to the west a small portion of the supplies for which he and his brothers had already paid and to return with the furs his men had collected and brought down to michilimackinac 
thus ended sadly enough the devoted efforts of this remarkable family of explorers to complete the long search for a route overland to the pacific ocean the brothers la verandrie ruined in purse and denied opportunity fell into obscurity and were forgotten it remains only to tell briefly of the attempts of st pierre and his men to carry out the same great project in obedience to the governor's instructions st pierre left montreal in the spring of seventeen fifty he paddled up the ottawa and then through lake nipissing and down the french river to georgian bay he crossed lake huron to Matchilimackinac, where he remained for a short time to give his men a rest then he pushed on to grand portage where he spent some time in talking to the indians in spite of his ungenerous treatment of the sons of la verandrie st pierre was a brave and capable soldier but he knew very little of the hardships of western exploration or of the patience needed in dealing with indians he grumbled bitterly about the difficulties and hardships of the portages which la verandrie had taken as a matter of course and instead of treating the indians with patience and forbearance he lost no opportunity to harangue and scold them we need not wonder therefore that the natives who had looked up to la verandrie as a superior being soon learned to dislike the overbearing st pierre and would do nothing to help him in his attempts at exploration st pierre visited fort st charles he spent the winter at fort maurepas in the spring of seventeen fifty one he went on to fort la reine meanwhile he had sent niverville a young officer of his party to the saskatchewan river with instructions to push his discoveries westward beyond the farthest point reached by la verandrie winter had set in before niverville set out on his long journey and he travelled over the snow and ice with snowshoes dragging his provisions on toboggans he knew nothing of the indian method of harnessing dogs to their toboggans and he and his men dragged the toboggans themselves he travelled slowly across lake winnipeg over rough ice and through deep snowdrifts with no protection from the bitter winds so great were the hardships that in the end he was compelled to abandon some of the heavier supplies and provisions before he and his men reached fort pascoyac they were at the point of starvation during the last few days they had nothing to eat but a few small fish caught through holes in the ice niverville was taken seriously ill and had to remain at fort pascoyac while some of his men in the spring of seventeen fifty one ascended the saskatchewan in canoes these men we are told paddled up the river to the foot of the rocky mountains where they built a fort named fort la jonquiere in honour of the governor later in the year niverville followed his men up the river at fort la jonquiere he met a party of western indians who told him that in the course of a war expedition they had encountered a number of indians of a strange tribe carrying loads of beaver skins these strange indians told the frenchmen that they were on their way over the rocky mountains to trade their furs with white men on the sea coast for some reason either through lack of supplies or because he did not possess the courage and enthusiasm which had carried the la verandries through so many difficulties niverville made no effort to cross the mountains this attempt to reach the western sea ended so far as french explorers were concerned at fort la jonquiere all the toils and hardships of the french explorers ended in failure to achieve the great end at which they were aimed members of another race reaped the coveted reward many years later a scottish canadian explorer alexander mackenzie realized la verandrie's dream by successfully crossing the rocky mountains and forcing his way through the difficult country that lay beyond until at last he stood upon the shores of the pacific ocean meanwhile st pierre had remained at fort la reine leaving the work of exploration to his young lieutenant niverville one incident of his life there remains to be described before we close this story of the search for the western sea it cannot be better told than in st pierre's own narrative Quote, on february twenty two seventeen fifty two he says about nine o'clock in the morning i was at this post with five frenchmen i had sent the rest of my people consisting of fourteen persons to look for provisions of which i had been in need for several days i was sitting quietly in my room when two hundred assiniboines entered the fort all of them armed these indians scattered immediately all through the place several of them even entered my room but unarmed others remained in adjacent parts of the fort my people came to warn me of the behaviour of these indians i ran to them and told them sharply that they were very impudent to come in a crowd to my house and armed one of them answered in the cree language that they came to smoke i told them that they were not behaving properly and that they must leave the fort at once i believe that the firmness with which i spoke somewhat frightened them especially as i put four of the most resolute out of the door without their saying a word i went at once to my room at that very moment however a soldier came to tell me that the guard-house was full of indians who had taken possession of the arms i ran to the guard-house and demanded through a cree interpreter what they meant by such behaviour during all this time i was preparing to fight them with my weak force my interpreter who proved a traitor said that these indians had no bad intentions 
yet a moment before an assiniboine orator who had been constantly making fine speeches to me had told the interpreter that in spite of him the indians would kill and rob me when i had barely made out their intentions i failed to realize that i ought to have taken their arms from them to frighten them i seized hold of a blazing brand broke in the door of the powder magazine and knocked down a barrel of gunpowder over this i held the brand and i told the indians in an assured tone through the interpreter that i expected nothing at their hands and that even if i was killed i should have the glory of subjecting them to the same fate no sooner had the indians seen the lighted brand and the barrel of gunpowder with its head staved in and heard my interpreter than they all fled out of the gate of the fort they damaged the gate considerably in their hurried flight i soon laid down my brand and then i had nothing more exciting to do than to close the gate of the fort End quote. soon after this incident with the assiniboines st pierre gave up his half-hearted attempt to find a route to the western sea and returned to montreal he had proved himself a brave man enough he did not however understand and made no attempt to understand the character of the indians and as an explorer he was a complete failure in a couple of years he managed to undo all the work which la verandrie had accomplished after he abandoned the west the forts which had been built there with such difficulty and at such great expense soon fell into decay the only men who had the knowledge and the enthusiasm to make real la verandrie's dream of exploration his own sons were denied the privilege of doing so and no one else seemed anxious even to attempt such a difficult task the period of french rule in canada was now rapidly drawing to a close instead of adding to the territories of france in north america her sons were preparing to make their last stand in defence of what they already possessed half a dozen years later their dream of western exploration and of a great north american empire reaching from the atlantic to the pacific came to an end on the plains of abraham it was left for those of another race who came after them to turn the dream of their rivals into tangible achievements it must never be forgotten however that although pierre de la verandrie failed to complete the great object of his ambition we owe to him and his gallant sons the discovery of a large part of what is today western canada end of chapter six and of Pathfinders of the Great Plains by Lawrence J. Burpee